Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I want to wish you all a very warm welcome to this new online lecture of the Material and Written, written Culture of Christian Egypt series, which is organized once a month by the digital edition of the Coptic Old Testament Project and the University of Göttingen's Seminar for Egyptology and Coptic Studies. My name is Alin Suchu. I am a senior researcher at the Göttingen Academy, and it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today and to be introducing this event. I see we have uh, uh, people joining us from uh, across the globe. It's a large audience. It gives me a very great pleasure to welcome Professor Jacques van der Fleet arguably one of the most significant uh, coptologists of his uh, generation. Professor van der Fleet was until his uh, recent retirement, lecturer of Coptic language and literature at the University of Leiden, where he taught for uh, many years. He is also professor emeritus of uh, Egyptology and Coptology at the Ratbaut University uh, in uh, Nijmegen. He uh, currently acts as a project leader at the Netherlands Institute for the Near East in Leiden with the aim of uh, publishing the Greek, Coptic and uh, Arabic manuscripts discovered by the Polish archaeological mission at uh, Nakloon in the Fayum oasis. Among his uh, numerous accomplishments, I would like to mention that in 2008, he uh, took up the presidency of the International uh, Society uh, of uh, Coptic Studies, the, sorry, the International Association uh, of Coptic Studies. Before that, he was a Congress secretary and uh, played a key role in organizing the seventh International Congress of Coptic Studies, which took place in uh, Leiden at the threshold of a new millennium, that is between 27th of August and 2nd of September 2000. Jacques is a, a scholar of a huge distinction whose uh, work had a significant impact on uh, numerous aspects of the history of Christian Egypt and uh, Nubia. He has brought a robust contribution, especially to the study of the literary and the epigraphic remains, which took the form of many volumes of edited texts and inscriptions. His uh, long list of publications includes the uh, Coptic Life of Aaron, which he published together with uh, Itze Dijkstra in 2020 in Brill's Supplements uh, to Vigilia Christiane series. And this book is a personal favorite of mine as it, uh, it is highly illuminating for the spread of Christianity in the southernmost uh, area of Egypt. He published also the catalog of the Coptic inscriptions in the Sudan National Museum in uh, Khartoum with uh, Peters in the Orientalia Lovaniensia Analecta series in 2003. The very important book on Panopolis in antiquity, which he co-edited with uh, Egberts and Moose in 2002, and the acts of the 2000 Coptic Congress in Leiden uh, with which I am uh, sure that many of you are familiar. Jacques has been a champion of expanding our knowledge in a lot of different areas of the study of the ancient and medieval world. He has been working on Gnosticism, on magical texts, literary sources in different ancient languages, documentary papyri, inscriptions, and funerary stele. So Jacques will be uh, speaking to us today about the Coptic Sahidic version of the uh, Apocalypse of Paul. And uh, by this, I mean the so-called Visio Pauli, not the Gnostic Nag Hammadi uh, text, which has the same title. Uh, the Apocalypse of Paul uh, was the most popular and uh, influential apocalyptic text in ancient and medieval Christianity originally composed in Greek, probably during the fourth century. 
and translated in virtually almost all languages of the Christian East, but also in Latin and from Latin in many European uh, vernacular languages. Especially the, uh, the long tour of hell and the uh, judgment scenes, which are depicted in the uh, Apocalypse of Paul, had an mm -hmm. impact on the iconographic program of many uh, churches and monasteries from different geographical areas. And many scholars even believe that one of the Latin uh, redactions of the text was known to uh, Dante and it influenced his description of the inferno and the punishment of the sinners in the uh, Divina uh, Commedia. Now I give the floor to uh, Jacques van der Fleet. Enjoy our lecture and see you later for the Q&A session. Jacques, please. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Aileen, for your, uh, for your very nice uh, uh, and flattering uh, introduction. Um, and uh, thank you all of you for uh, joining uh, joining us uh, this uh, this afternoon for a um, lecture that will be a bit um, technical and philological, but I still hope you will be able to enjoy if at least I am able to. Yes, I am. am. I should click this away. Um, what I would like to, um, to do to, to this afternoon uh, is, uh, well, um, to um, present you, first of all, a kind of, uh, well, um, uh, um, preview of the current project for the re-edition of the Coptic Sahedic Apocalypse of Paul and its backgrounds, very briefly. Then something about the text and uh, its rather complicated history. Uh, some of which you have heard uh, just now already uh, from uh, from uh, Alin. And then finally, and that's basically the, the subject of uh, my talk today, uh, something about the status and the value of the Coptic text in particular compared to um, the other versions that the many other versions uh, that exist. First of all, I would like to start with a piece with a bit of uh, personal experience I had long ago when I was uh, reading for my uh, PhD, when I was reading through the, um, uh, through the volume, uh, Butcher's volume of miscellaneous Coptic text in the, in the dialect of Upper Egypt. And at a certain moment, I arrived at page 534. And while I was really still uh, reading a, a homily attributed to uh, St. John Chrysostom about um, uh, the Archangel Raphael, I suddenly met the uh, enigmatic words 80 pages wanting and then was plunged into the middle of the apocalypse without any, any, any warning. I was plunged into the middle of the text of the uh, Sahidic apocalypse of Paul. This was my first acquaintance with this text and it was rather a disturbing one because, um, well, uh, the text as printed by Butch is printed in a very strange and actually very inaccurate and um, uh, um, uh, and wrong, simply wrong order. So starting somewhere, somewhere in the middle without any word of explanation. And then you need the, um, basically you need the translation to, uh, to see somehow, well, the logic in his, uh, very poor logic in his uh, in his edition. So I did what probably many colleagues of mine also did. I um, I cried out, "What a mess!" and I closed the book. Uh, other people have been more um, well, more courageous, I would say. And uh, in the beginning of the uh, of the present century, people started to look more carefully than I did at the time. To this, to the apocalypse of Coptic apocalypse of uh, of Paul, in 2001, Kirsty Copeland um, um, defended her uh, PhD thesis in the, in the, uh, her doctoral dissertation on Princeton University mapping the apocalypse of Paul, and in this um, uh, in her in her uh, dissertation, she also 
gives the full text plus an English translation of the Sahidic Coptic um, uh, text of the Apocalypse, Apocalypse of Paul in a far better way than Butch did before her. Regrettably, her dissertation, which is really a fine dissertation in my opinion, remained unpublished. More or less at the same time, uh, Lautaro Roch Lancilotta, who is presently um, professor of New Testament in, in the University of Groningen, uh, also worked on, but in a bit different way, on the Coptic Apocalypse of, uh, of Paul. And in 2007, he published a seminal article, which is actually the basis, became the basis for um, our current cooperation, which should somehow um, end up uh, with a re-edition, a critical re-edition of the um, uh, Coptic Apocalypse of Paul, the Sahidic manuscript that Butch used um, with a translation and a full uh, commentary. And we hope to publish this book by next year. We try to finish the manuscript in the course of the next summer. So that is a bit the background uh, behind my um, uh, behind today's uh, lecture. The Apocalypse of Paul, um, uh, Alin has said already the most essential things about it, so I can be very brief here. The Apocalypse of Paul is in the terminology of, uh, of uh, Martha Himmelferbs in by now classical study of 1983, a tour of hell and also a tour of heaven. It is a guided tour. Paul sees everything in, in the heavens and in, in, in the underworld, in hell, and he is guided by, a, uh, by an angel who explains to him what he sees. He sees all kinds of things, he asks questions, and he, that's, they are explained, what he sees is explained to him by an, uh, an angel. Now, the reputation of St. Paul as a visionary of course, it goes back to a um, rather enigmatic passage in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul um, apparently describes his own, um, his own uh, um, visionary experience that's, that transported him to the third heaven and to, um, um, uh, and to uh, celestial uh, paradise. Um, Another work that, well, uh, yeah, used these, say, this, this picture, this image of St. Paul as a visionary is the Gnostic Apocalypse of Paul that was already mentioned by, um, by uh, Aline uh, in his introduction, and that will not be the subject of today's talk. As uh, Aline also uh, already mentioned, um, the Apocalypse of Paul became part of world literature trans transmitted in East and in West and it, it, it fed the, the, the uh, Christian imagination of heaven and hell, uh, even uh, apparently uh, inspired uh, Dante. And uh, well, you find the, the influence of, um, of the apocalypse of, apocalypse of Paul, not only in, 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 in literature, but also in um, uh, the visual arts, in the decoration of our European cathedrals and so on. So a work of world literature. Um, what does the work offer? Also here, I will be very brief. Yeah, uh, the, um, the work is basically, it's not only, first of all, it is not only about hell. The part, parts about hell became very important. They became very popular, they, were, they became very proper. Apparently they, they, they appealed uh, very much to the, um, um, uh, to the readers, but the, um, text as a whole is not just about hell. It is a kind of cosmic tour that takes Paul to various parts of the cosmos and um, um, uh, not only to hell, uh, to the east, to the west, up, he goes in various directions and everywhere what he sees is explained to him by, um, by uh, the angel. I will go very briefly with you through the um, through the contents of the um, so to say the table of contents of the uh, of the apocalypse. There's first there is a prologue to which we will come back in a, in, in a minute. There's an introduction. There's the whole whole of nature is complaining about the many sins that humanity uh, commits. 
Um, um, and Paul receives his mission, um, uh, that is to report about the punishments um, that um, await the sinners and about the rewards that are, are promised to the righteous people. And that is basically what the whole text does. It visualizes very much, very visually, um, it visually both reward for the righteous and on the other hand, punishments for the sinners. Then in chapters from chapter 11 onwards, there's, that's really the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of Paul's uh, voyage, of his tour. Um, he's first, first witnessing the, the death and trial of, on the one hand, a sinner, on the other hand, a righteous person. So they are contrasted. And this kind of contrasting things, yeah, in kind of yeah, um, symmetric uh, chapters, that is very characteristic of the text throughout. Um, these chapters are only partly preserved in Coptic, because in Coptic, in the Coptic manuscript that I will introduce to you in a minute, the first four, 15 chapters are not present. They are simply lacking. There, there is a, a, a lacuna in the manuscript. The manuscript starts with chapter 16, and there we are still um, watching the trial of sinners um, and, of course, how bad it ends. Then Paul is transported to the, very briefly, to the third heaven. Uh, from there, he goes to the east, to the, to the east of the inhabited world. And in the east, I'm pointing it in the wrong direction, that doesn't matter. Uh, in the east, uh, he finds first the land of inheritance, which, which uh, rich growth of, of, of grapevines, fruits, and so on. And then the city of, of Christ. From there, he is transported again to another extremity of the world, to the west, to the farthest west. And what he finds there is hell. Um, there's a, um, well, there's a, a number of chapters devoted to the various punishments that the diseased are undergoing, the sinful diseased are undergoing in hell, which end with a rather impressive scene in which uh, Christ grants the Sunday as a day of respite for all the people, for all the sinners who are undergoing punishments, horrible punishments in hell. After this scene, Paul is leaving again, now to earthly paradise, where he meets the Virgin Mary. Well, first of all, he sees the Garden of Eden, then he meets the Virgin Mary, and then he is welcomed by a whole series of um, saints from the Old Testament. From there, he has another, he makes another very brief trip to the third heaven. And from there, finally, at least in the Coptic version, to um, celestial paradise, where he sees the rewards that are awaiting the saints, and also his own rewards, his thro the thrones and the crowns that are waiting for the apostles in heaven. Then there is an epilogue, which is proper to the Coptic and to which we will come back also in a minute. This text has known a very complicated history. As you may guess, it has been translated into many languages. It probably comes from Egypt. I will come back a bit on, on that uh, the provenance a bit uh, later on. Uh, it was probably written in the fourth century. And, but from Egypt, it spread over the entire Christian world, as Alain has, Alain has already uh, uh, told us. Um, originally written in Greek, it was translated into many, many languages and revised, and uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in many, many languages, vernaculars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we know um, that it circulated for sure that it circulated in Constantinople just before 450. It circulated there, it was known there together with a prologue, um, with a prologue that tells a very weird story about how this apocalypse was discovered in the year 388 
um, in the foundations of the former house of the apostle Paul in Tarsus. Tarsus was the, 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 the home city of, uh, of, um, of uh, the apostle. And there it was buried in the foundations of its house and to be discovered only in 388. So we know for sure that this prologue um, must post date the year 388, probably even the year 395, the last regnal year of Theodosius the Great, who is mentioned in this prologue. So this prologue, at least, and the um, the form of the text that it introduces dates from after 390 and before 450. Of the Greek, we only have a medieval revision that considerably abridges the text, um, and which we know already since 1860. It's published a long, quite a long time ago. Besides, there are Syriac, Armenian, Old Slavonic, German, etc., etc., translations. The best text, however, according to past scholarship, the last well century of scholarship, is um, the long Latin version. In particular, the long Latin version, as it is preserved in a, a ninth century, probably ninth century. Uh, manuscript now in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale. This is generally considered till now by many scholars, by most scholars, simply the best text that we have of the Apocalypse of the Apocalypse of Paul. Second best is usually considered the Syriac, um, which well must have translate, been translated from the Greek, of course, but from a different Greek text than the medi medieval revision that we have now. The Coptic, on the other hand, enjoys a very, very bad press. And I will come back to that in a minute. Because I will be focusing now on the Coptic version, rather. Um, this Coptic version, this Sahidic version, I should say properly, is surviving in one incomplete manuscript of which you see on the slide. I hope you all see the slide properly. Um, you see the slide with the last page of this manuscript and um, in the lower right corner, the colophon of the manuscript. Um, this yeah, uh, manuscript was copied in the 10th century. It is precisely dated in Esna um, by a member of a family of copyists in the year 960. Besides, there are two very, very tiny fragments that may date from the 5th, 6th century and that were uh, identified as such uh, by uh, Anti Marianen and Ali Tsuchu, our host of uh, today. Um, well, with this Coptic text, with this Sahidic text, there are various. I will fo be focusing on the on the on the on the Esna manuscript, uh, of course, because it's, that is the, the most important for us. The problems with this Coptic Sahidic text are manifold. First of all, in the British Library, this manuscript is kept under two signatures in two modern bindings, and in a wrong and the the Apocalypse of Paul uh, is bound with the choirs in a wrong order and provided with a modern foliation, so folio numbers, uh, that um, ignores the entirely correct um, uh, Coptic page numbers that are given and is completely wrong. Um, besides, so the, the, the circumstances under which this um, manuscript came to us are yeah, not very, yeah, not very favorable. Then the, the manuscript itself has some defects. First of all, the first, fir the first 15 chapters, including an, a possible prologue, are lacking because the choir in uh, the manuscript lacks the choir in which these chapters 
uh, ones were written. Uh, then there is a minor lacuna later on in the text um, uh, of two pages or one folio. That is a minor defect. Now, um, these, um, well, this rather strange prehistory of the manuscript, which is two, two signatures, these two bindings, the wrong order of choirs, plus its own defects, um, and a number of other mistakes um, are responsible for the very bad quality of the edition by Butch of 1915. Because Butch, in his um, uh, edition, apparently, in preparing his edition, apparently had not noticed that the, uh, at first the choirs were in a wrong order. And he followed the modern uh, erroneous foliation, the folio numbers. So that explains why his edition follows, well, gives the text in a very weird order. Well, that made me many years ago close the book and say, what a mess. Yeah? Only when you read his translation, you see you you see that there's well the, he, he 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 translated the text in the in the correct order. But even then, he made serious mistakes about the uh, the numbers of pages that were lacking, so that you get the impression from his edition that you, that there is a, a huge number of pages missing, while actually uh, there's only the fifteen first chapters. Uh, missing. Um, so that created uh, that created the picture of a very incomplete um, text, practically wordless for purposes of uh, well, for scholarly purposes. Um, this um, idea of the Coptic as a really an inferior witness that is both incomplete and overcomplete. Overcomplete, I will explain in a minute. So it has lots of things, not, not the first, it lacks the first 14 chapters, but it also has additional chapters with other versions not have. Then the, the, the wrong idea that Butch had of how the manuscript looked like, because he had, a, well, he, he wrongly interpreted the, the, num the numbering of the choirs, so you get very strange things. This, um, um, well, this um, made altogether that the Coptic was inferior, that the Coptic was viewed, generally viewed as a very inferior witness, pra practically worthless for textual criticism. Moreover, um, there was a very influential person uh, who apparently did not like the Coptic version. And that was Montague Rhodes James, who was, of course, a great scholar, and at the time, the authority in the field of studies of Christian apocryphal texts, really a great scholar. Um, but uh, he was very negative about the Coptic witness, the Sahidic Coptic witness of the apocalypse. He actually, he, for him, everything that came after the passages about hell, um, they were, he called it an otios appendix. That's, that's something could, that could be missed. And the last chapters, which are proper to the Coptic only, he called uh, nicely a pasticcio from other Coptic apocrypha. And the whole thing was, in his opinion, so contaminated with, 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 with really kind of colonial uh, disdain he called native Egyptian stuff. Well, that's the kind of things those Copts in the very south of Egypt perhaps liked, but that had nothing to do with the real apocalypse at all. The early 21st century saw a major turning point. First of all, there is the, what I call here the codological turn. Uh, my colleague uh, Lautaro Roj Lancilota um, he, um, he undertook for the first time a, a codicological study of 
the London of the British Library uh, of the British Library manuscript, and how he could correct all the errors made by uh, by uh, by Butch, and uh, well, come up with uh, finally with a real correct uh, codicological um, um, reconstruction uh, of the text, putting the things in the in the right order. In at the same time, he also undertook a textual comparison of his, say, normalized Coptic Sahidic version with the Latin, together with a kind of reassessment, or kind of a reassessment of its literary structure. And his conclusions, which once more are the basis of our present uh, uh, project, that are that the um, Coptic is not at all inferior to the so-called best text, to the Latin text of the Paris manuscript, but that it's rather often superior to the Latin, uh, to the Latin text. And also that the literary structure of the Coptic text is um, yeah, not at all this kind of pasticcio, but that it is really a well balanced, well made text. It is not a masterwork, whatever you may say, but 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 it's still it is a well constructed, well conceived text. So in all kinds of um, ways, um, not inferior to the Latin, but often in uh, superior. At the same time, there was also what you might call a chronological term. Earlier scholars often assumed that the uh, text would be as old as the second half of the second century or otherwise the beginning of the third century. In a seminal essay uh, uh, published in 2009, uh, Jan Bremer, also from Groningen, uh, um, argued very convincingly that this text, that the Apocalypse of Paul, as we have it, uh, can not have been written before the middle of the fourth century, so that it was basically well, yeah, written in the second half of the fourth century, probably in Egypt, probably in a monastic background. And uh, already uh, the dissertation of Kirsty Copeland that I mentioned earlier, uh, argued convincingly for links with Pagomian monasticism. Yeah, um, when you compare the Coptic with the other available versions, and there are many of them, but for, as there are many of them, I will focus a bit on what has always been considered the best text. So as a uh, well, whole placeholder for all other versions, I will rather focus here on the Latin and compare the Coptic with these other versions, in particular the, so with the, that's in particular with the, with the long uh, Latin version. When you compare these texts, there are two major text critical problems. First of all, the Coptic has a different frame story. It has no prologue, the prologue is lost, but it has an epilogue. And this epilogue does something that is very familiar to most of you, I guess. Um, this epilogue situates the whole thing on the Mount of Olives in a dialogue of the risen Christ with his apostles. Now, this is a very um, familiar and widespread in Christian, within Christian Egypt, a very familiar and widespread way of yeah, framing all kinds of revelations. And our apocalypse is no exception. You find this in Pisti Sophia, you find this in various uh, uh, treatises from Naga Hamadi, and it is an important part of the makeup of what uh, Alan uh, uh, Susu calls uh, apostolic memoirs, and Joost Hagen, I think, diaries of the apostles. So this is very familiar for over centuries. This Mount of Olives setting witnessed in the manuscript that we have only by the epilogue is not reconcilable, cannot be reconciled with the so-called Tarsus prologue, 
the very nice story that, situ that circulated already in the early fifth century. And that tells how the uh, manuscript was discovered in the um, uh, foundations of the house of Paul in Tarsus. So, well, what to make out of this? The second problem is in the Coptic extras. The Coptic, as I, as I told you already, is in a sense overcomplete. It has a long ending, chapters 51 to 62, so that is over, over uh, 10 chapters, um, that comprise the end of the scene in Earthly Paradise, the visit to the third heaven, and the visit to Celestial par Paradise, and the depiction of the rewards of the saints there, and of course the epilogue. All this is not in the Latin version, nor in any other version that has preserved to us, but for our Coptic Sahidic version. Now, what, ah, this is, uh, I, um, to, to make it very clear for you, I, I did something with colors and, uh, uh, um, and, uh, uh, arrows. Um, um, the things here in red are not in Coptic. Coptic starts with chapter 16, simply because these pages are lacking, physically lacking in the manuscript. Um, then the parts in green are in the Coptic, but not in the Latin version, which what takes place of all other ancient versions. Um, from the middle of chapter 51, the Latin, oh, sorry, the Latin stops, the Latin stops, and Coptic continues. So there you have third heaven, celestial paradise. Um, I would like to point out once more uh, something important. The, the, the position of hell, which is made bold in this, uh, on this slide, uh, which is very central. And the whole text, as we have it in the Coptic, is, so to say, organized around this, these central chapters about hell. You have to see twice third heaven. It's all symmetrically, symmetrically organized as the author loved to do it. This author loved symmetric opposites. Uh, uh, they loved uh, sim uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, symmetrical descriptions, first of the fate of the sinners, then of the fate of the righteous. So that is central to it. So um, if you take off the lower part, as the Latin does, the hell comes somewhere yeah, a bit lost at the end. We'll come back to that. Now, there's two major um, text critical issues. And um, there, of course, there are several ways out of this um, mess. So, if I may. Um, the first, of course, is by, say, internal criticism, by looking how the Coptic text of the Apocalypse of Paul. Paul is organized. How, how, yeah, how, how does it work? And when you're going to look, um, we're going to look at the um, Apocalypse of Paul in its Sahidic version, you see that it is a very balanced and coherent composition. Its aim from the beginning onwards, from the beginning to the end, is say the opposition between reward for the righteous, punishment for the sinners. So from this results, a kind of, as I told you before, a kind of symmet symmetrical organization of the material um, grouped in say concentric circles around the central uh, episode about the punishments of hell. Furthermore, the author has a great, um, preference for a precise cosmographical um, uh, indications. 
for precise spatial settings. Cosmography, it's not just about hell, you know, and, and uh, uh, cosmography had a, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the visualization, I would say, of how the cosmos is organized, yeah, takes a very important, is very important, is a very important structuring element, I would say, of, uh, of the text. Um, um, this st structural principle is um, intimately connected with morals, with a moral view of how the world, the cosmos, is organized. And as my colleague nicely put it, the cosmography of the apocalypse of Paul reflects theodicy. That's to say, it reflects the way how um, uh, God in a in a, in, a, in a just and uh, um, uh, and righteous way promises the good and punishes evil. So this is all somehow built into the text. And that's why, if I may go back here, that's why the, the text has such, uh, has such a nice concentric structure. You see the hell is in the middle, there are, there are a few introductory chapters, of course. And in the end, there is, the, there is a whole series of scenes actually in praise of Paul himself. But in between, there is this, 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 um, um, this structural core. Um, and around this core, there are these various layers so organized. So um, um, from the point of view of internal criticism, the text is balanced. The Coptic text, I would say, as we have it, is balanced coherent uh, uh, yeah, and um, well well thought of, well structured, well designed, that's the correct word. Another way out, of course, is via the uh, via textual comparison, via the very um, uh, traditional means of textual criticism and looking at other texts. Textual criticism, first of all, that's perhaps the most traditional thing, the thing you're used to, comparing the Coptic with the other versions. Now, what facts do we have when we compare the Coptic with the Latin? Um, first of all, there is this absurd end in the middle of chapter 51. This is an, an arbitrary end. It is a, a crack in the text. Somebody, broke off the text here. And there it stops, the Latin. Um, and that's not only an interruption, I should say, of the storyline, but it also robs the text of its logical conclusion. Because we had a prologue in the beginning, and what you expect then is a mirroring epilogue that, for example, tells how and under which conditions Paul buried the text of his revelation in the foundations of his house in Tarsus. But such an epilogue lacks in the Latin. In other words, we have a very incomplete, a demonstrably incomplete text here. The Coptic, however, continues the text in a logical way. Uh, it goes on a bit as it went. And, 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 is on the whole in these additional chapters, these extra chapters, textually coherent. It has the full chapter 51 and then 52, what you expect um, at the, the end of the series of meetings between Paul and the saints of the Old Testament. And it has an epilogue. It has this Mount of Olives epilogue. Christ, well, the apostles together on the Mount of Olives, Christ popping up and giving his blessings to the text of the Revelation. But this Coptic, Sahidic epilogue does not match the Latin prologue. They are irreconcilable. You can actually reconstruct the Mount of Olives 
of Olive's prologue, which we do not have, a bit on the basis of the Mount of Olives epilogue. So, some obvious conclusions are that, um, first of all, all versions except the Coptic are incomplete of their end and lack the expected of the epilogue. And all versions except the Coptic derive from an archetype, from a model, from an exemplar that, yeah, somehow lost its last choir at an early stage. And if the Coptic ending is original, the Mount of Olives frame with the epilogue, maybe too. This was already assumed by Robert P. Casey in 1933, who claimed, and I think he is right in claiming that, that the Coptic represents what he calls a pre-Tarsus version of the text. So a version, a form of the text that predates the so-called Tarsus prologue. And hence was his second conclusion that the Coptic version is not worthless for textual criticism, but text critically important. Um, the second, or the next means of, um, um, well, so to say, um, tackling the problem, well, of these, these various issues raised by the uh, Coptic version. That is intertextuality. That is basically, in, in, in this case, restoring the text to the literary landscape of late antique Egypt. What do we see? How does the text of the Apocalypse of Paul relate to other texts from the same area, from more or less the same period, late antiquity. Now, as I should first of all emphasize that the Apocalypse of Paul is in a sense an original work, but it's also not very original. It is a work, positively phrased, a work of erudition. That is to say, it uses material from everywhere. The author was a, a scholar yeah, who combined motifs and themes from a wide variety of earlier sources that were, that were available in late antique Egypt. And some of these sources we can identify, we can pinpoint them precisely. In particular, and these are well-known examples, this is, I didn't find this out myself, the Testament of Abraham, uh, the Apocalypse, the, the much older Apocalypse of Peter, and the Apocalypse, so-called Apocalypse of, uh, of Stefania, the status of which is less, uh, is less clear. So we have precise borrowings from these texts. So a likely inference is that the extras of the Coptic text um, instead of being native Egyptian stuff, um, and perhaps also the Mount of Olives frame, um, represent within the text of the um, Apocalypse of Paul, they represent what I call the weight of tradition. They are traditional elements. This Mount of Olives frame, for example, which was used, yeah, um, uh, occurs already in one of the identifiable models of and important models of the Apocalypse of Paul, the Apocalypse of Peter. It also has this frame story set on the Mount of Olives with Jesus and the apostles. So um, many of these extras of the Coptic are more likely to be original than not. Um, yeah, looking at it if, in another direction, how was the text received of the Apocalypse of Paul in the fourth century Apocalypse of Paul in later or in other perhaps contemporary literary works from late antique Egypt? And then it appears that the Apocalypse of Paul was a very popular work, not only in the Latin West, or yeah, but uh, also in Egypt, in Christian Egypt itself. And we find once again, precise egos, precise um, uh, traces 
um, that can be pinpointed with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a great degree of, of probability in, um, well, two classes of literature, I would say, in Pagomian literature, in particular in the Bohairic and Sahidic lives of Pagomius. Yeah? There are some, there are very clear egos, borrowings from the, um, um, uh, from the Apocalypse of Paul. And once more, it was not me who invented this. This has been observed by earlier scholars as well. And another um, group, I would say, of texts is what I call here in a rather loose sense, uh, say, uh, visionary, um, visionary literature, both of an apoc apocryphal nature and magical of a magical nature, mainly preserved in Coptic, such as the installation of Michael, the archangel, about which we heard Hugo, Hugo Lundhauk a few weeks uh, a few, few weeks ago, the vision of Siofanes in, in the book of Bartholomew, and uh, the definitely also fairly late test, testament of, I, of Isaac. I, looking at the time, I have not so much, not so much time but left, but um, in the installation of Michael, of course, what you find there, you find there the theme of, uh, the theme of, of respite for the souls who are punished in hell on the festival day of, uh, of Michael, in terms that, that clearly show that this theme derives from the apocalypse of Paul. You find the baptism in the Agarusian lake, if it interests you, and uh, in the very end, the the nice scene of the uh, um, of the uh, innocent infants that were murdered by by Herod, at on the uh, and who inhabit the uh, who, who live near the uh, river of milk. Just to mention a few uh, examples. Um, so we can make some more inferences. The overcomplete text of the Coptic, so the text including um, the chapters that were out of hand rejected by Montague wrote James 100 years ago, uh, this overcomplete text was widely known and received in later contemporary or later monastic and visionary liter literature from Egypt. And even I would like to say, in my opinion, it played a crucial role even in imagining this kind of unthinkable worlds, these other worlds in what is often called Coptic literature. Right? It's the, the, the scenes about the contrasting fate of the sinners and the righteous when they are dying, the, the topography, topography of heaven and hell, periodical respite for the sinners in hell, this, all these kind of themes, they all point in the direction of the Apocalypse of Paul. And I even would like to say that the influence of the Apocalypse of Paul in, in so-called Coptic literature is secondarily to the Bible and the life of Saint Anthony. In other words, a central text, a text that at once looks backward and draws upon the earlier apocryphal tradition, mainly of texts that we know from Egypt, and on the other hand, looks forward to later visionary literature transmitted in Christian Northeast Africa and primarily in Coptic. So we have the Coptic rehabilitated in my view, which you are not obliged to share. In spite of material lacunae, the Coptic represents a, in my opinion, in our opinion, a complete and coherent form of the text that yeah, you might wish to split up, but you cannot split it up merely on the basis of a priori judgments, saying, oh, this is native Egyptian stuff. Well, yeah, can't belong to the original Apocalypse of Paul. And it represents an early form of the text that predates the post-390 Tarsus prologue. And in general, I would say, the Sahidic text, in spite of this serious lack, of course, that it, it misses the, the, the first 15 chapters, uh, it is as close as we can get to the original fourth century apocalypse of Paul, and a major influence in shaping the 
unthinkable world of later Christian literature. A final re personal reflection. I started with a personal reflection on, uh, on how I first met the Sahidic Apocalypse of Paul in a rather unfortunate way in uh, Butch's uh, edition. A final a personal word about how it feels to um, re-edit this text. It really feels like cleaning an old master painting. You know, paintings in the in in, uh, 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 in 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 the course of the centuries, they collect layers of dust. Of of of, uh, they get brownish. Uh, uh, the varnish turns brown, and then you can't see what it represents. But this felt a bit like yeah, peeling off layers of prejudice, colonial prejudice and a priori judgments about the text. And what comes to light is really a bright and lively and coherent picture. I'm not going to say that it is a master, a masterpiece, a masterwork. It's not a Rembrandt in its genre, but uh, it is still an important monument of Christian Egyptian literature. And with this conclusion, I would like to thank you for your attention.